In previous videos, I've gone over how you select the optimal bioreact for your given application. However, once you've done that and once you've optimized conditions, in this video, I'll explain how you can actually set up and install the bioreactor so it's ready for operation. I am Professor Marlies Peters and I've got a set of videos that focus on bioreactors that are commonly used in the pharmaceutical industry. So do have a look at this playlist if you're interested in more videos on this topic. So in essence, I'll go over seven different steps where six of them are prior to operation and the final one is after that. So as I said, the key thing is always to make sure to make an informed decision with regards to your choice of the bioreactor, because that's very important in terms of how you're going to operate it, but you will also get a better idea of the capital investment that it's needed and it needs to be right for your system. The first thing to do though, when you've done all of these steps is to check the culture vessel. So a very critical thing that can go wrong is that there will be some leakage somewhere around some of the tubing. So it's critical to check the valves and the O-rings, which ensure that the whole system is sterile. And even then you might need to sterilize it to make sure that there's no blockage anywhere or that there's no remainder of any traces from the previous reaction, which we'll come back to later why the autoclaving is so important. The second part, and sometimes this comes after the autoclaving as well, so you might do it different times, is the installation and the calibration of the sensors. So some of these sensors depend on the operating conditions, so it might be better to calibrate them after the autoclaving. However, we first need to know what kind of, what are our critical process parameters. So you need to have an idea of what sensors are actually needed. Uh, a, a lot of them are quite standard. So think of, for instance, pH, temperature dissolved oxygen, if you're working in an aerobic culture. Um, so there's some standard ones and then there's some more specialized ones. So depending on your system, you would have to pick what sensors are essential. You need to make sure that they're in the right place. Uh, you might need to calibrate them, but you also need to make sure a lot of these sensors, uh, they might be made out of glass or something that's fragile. So check that they're actually working. Now, in step three, this is the important bit where I mentioned the autoclaving. So we need to make sure that there's no traces of any microorganisms that remain behind or anything else. So this just to make sure that there's no contamination in your system, because as you will see later on, this contamination is the one thing that probably interferes with your reaction the most. So a typical procedure tends to be around 30 minutes, uh, but you do have to consider that if you're working with certain specific chemicals, um, such as, for instance, like ammonia, there are some chemicals that can't withstand the sterilization. So you need to kind of consider first what can withstand the sterilization and check what's required in order to do this. Now, step four, after you've done that, and it might be also that you have to sterilize some of the media or autoclave it, then we can add the media to prepare the reaction for cultivation and we can start what we call the inoculation. So this is the step where you might want to calibrate your sensors again, because I said some of them heavily depend on the operating conditions. Having done all of that, so you have the media in there, then we can start up the actual reactor. So it basically means physically that we can turn it on. So there's a few things that we might want to check. So for instance, maybe we have to get the reactor to the required temperature first. We have to make sure that we have proper mixing. So we might want to start the stirring so everything is in place. All of this is done before you do the inoculation where you actually add the cultures that you're going to work with. In step five, this is where we typically add the microorganisms, even though I said there is some flexibility in how you do these different steps. Now, key things to consider is that it's very different whether you're working with a microbial system uh, versus cell culture. So cell cultures are much more prone to contamination but there's also certain conditions that they can't withstand if we're talking about, for instance, shear stress or certain temperatures. So you need to bear that in mind when you inoculate your system. Now, what you also might want to do is before you inoculate it to run like a kind of blank culture medium first, just to check if everything is a working order before you actually add the microorganisms. Step six, we're nearly there. This is kind of like the final bit before we can actually start the reaction. In bioreactors, it's very critical that we have a good control of our system. Because as I mentioned, like the thing is you're working with something which is living. So you need to continuously make sure that they are in a happy place and they have the right conditions that they can work in. 
So in order to ensure that you know what control is possible, you need to know the critical process parameters, which comes back to the sensor. So what are the conditions you need to monitor and the critical quality attributes to make sure that you have the required quality and efficacy of your reaction. So how will you monitor that afterwards? So what kind of quality control do you put in place? And um, typically before you get to this step, you will have done either some modeling or some smaller scale experimentation in, in order to work out what these systems are. So this is, we have the sensors in place, but for the control, we also need to control loops. So for instance, if we think of, for instance, pH, if we're working with acid base feedback, or maybe we, we add in with carbon dioxide, we can also influence the pH. So we need to make sure that these systems are also ready to go and that we've considered what the thresholds are. So in what range can we just let the reaction go? And when do we actually as operators need to intervene and say like, okay, there's something wrong. So how do we get it back to the levels that we want? And this is very, very important, this control, because besides the contamination, this is another critical step where it often goes wrong in terms of your quality. So having done all of this, this is when you can actually finally start your reaction and you can start producing your product. And the final step, what do you actually do when your reaction is finished? And how do you monitor that the reaction is finished? So normally you would check, first of all, if you're working with microorganisms, you would check their viability, because obviously they need to be viable in order to produce the product that you want. Or you might be able in situ for certain cases, be able to monitor directly the output of the reaction that you have. So bioprocess is very quite a lot. We have E. coli, which is, has got a really fast doubling time, so you can have a very fast reaction. So it can be anywhere from minutes to hours, sometimes to days, where you more typically have a fat batch reactor system, or even in certain continuous processes that can go on for months. Uh, and obviously, once it reaches steady state, it will be very important that you have these control loops in place in order to make sure that your reaction is going and that your yield is not impacted. However, very critical that after your reaction is done, you will need to decontaminate and clean your reactor. So particularly when you work with a batch system, you will definitely need to like autoclave and sterilize the system. There are various procedures and you shouldn't just focus on the reactor itself, but also the peripheral equipment and for instance, the tubing that's connected. Because often you will see people clean up your reactor very well, but they don't consider everything else that it's been in touch with. And given that microorganisms like to stick to surfaces, any kind of other equipment that you will have used will need to be autoclaved or sterilized. And this finally comes back to the two main points why your reaction might fail. Well, I mentioned before contamination, that it is a big thing. The second thing is that there might be issues related to the control of the critical parameters. So think of, for instance, the temperature. It might have happened that the temperature has gone off during the reaction. So obviously you would have sensors that would be monitoring that, but these sensors also have a failure rate. So it could be that they stop working, which is why you often have more than one sensor in different places, or that you didn't intervene soon enough. So you picked up the problem too late. And as I mentioned, when you're working with a live system, you need to make sure that you work according to the appropriate timeframes. So mammalian cell cultures typically have a very slow doubling time. So in that sense, you might allow yourself a bit more time. But if you're working with something which is fast growing, then you need to check on this far more regularly. So hopefully this short video has given you some insights in how you actually install and operate your bioreactor to so the whole startup process. Now, later on, so if you are more interested in how you select the right reactor, or how you control certain steps in your process, then do have a look at this playlist where I go over these other topics. Thanks very much for watching.